Good to be with you. Uh, happy Sunday. Uh, today we are starting a new series, and uh, it's called Sunday Gatherings. Uh, we wanted to call it Sunday Service, but Kanye got that title first, and we're like, hmm, Sunday Gatherings it is. And um, I want you to, to, to imagine a scenario with me. And in this scenario, you're given instructions to follow. You need to shovel sand into a bag. And once you've filled the bag with sand, you have to repeat the process. Take this bag, fill it with sand, and keep repeating it for hours. How long before you ask, what am I doing this for? But let's say you were given this piece of additional information. You're shoveling sand into a bag to create sandbags to protect people's homes from floodwaters. Same exact activity, but all of a sudden, there's a sense of purpose, right? A sense of urgency. What seemed like meaningless repetition now becomes deeply significant. And that's the difference that knowing the why can make, that the why can infuse the what with deep meaning and purpose. We often need to know the why behind the what to be motivated or inspired or moved to action. We need the reason behind the routines. And here's what's interesting. I've never heard a teaching series on why we do what we do when we gather on a Sunday morning. Like for many of us, this is part of our routine. It's a rhythm in our lives. And so we get out of bed early on a Sunday morning after a late night out with friends. We kind of, you know, if we have kids, we wrangle the kids and try to get them out of the door on time. Uh, we miss, I don't know, playoff football sometimes. We come during, you know, finals. And we come here and we sing songs and we hear a message and take communion and pray and, and give tithes and offerings and serve in Sunday ministry. And some of us do this every week. Why? Why are we doing this again? And so in this series, we're going to talk about that question. We're going to talk about why we gather on Sunday mornings, why we sing together, why we pray together, why we read and preach scripture, why we give together, why we take communion together. And this isn't a series on like community or mission or discipleship or justice or even the local church. It's, it's more narrow than that. In this series, we're talking about why we do this. And today we're talking about why we gather on Sundays. We don't go to church. We are the church gathered. But why do we gather? And maybe an easy answer would be, well, we gather to hear the word of God taught. Right? We gather to take communion together. We gather to sing together. We gather to pray together. And all of that would be true. But each of those answers is getting its own week. And so today I want to step back and give four other reasons why we gather. This is not an exhaustive list. I've had to make choices. But I want to give you four reasons why we gather, why we do this. Four points for this message. Point number one. We gather together because the early church gathered together. And I'm going to read you a descriptive text. It's from the book of Acts. And in saying this scripture is descriptive, I'm implying that this text isn't normative for us, meaning we don't have to do it this way, and we can't entirely for reasons that will become evident. But it's suggestive, and it gives us a window into how the early church gathered. And here's the context for the passage I'll read. Uh, Jesus has died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again. And he sent the promised Holy Spirit. It's been poured out. And Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, gets up and he preaches a sermon in Jerusalem. And a large number of people, they repent and they believe and they get baptized. And this new community is growing and forming around the Messiah, Jesus. And in this community, there's a description of it in Acts 2, verse 42 to 48, but it talks about this community being devoted to the apostles' teachings, which became the New Testament. They were devoted to the apostles' teachings. Uh, they were devoted to prayer. 
There was this radical generosity. People would sell their possessions to meet other people's needs. And then the text says this, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you. It says this, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There was something so compelling, so attractive about this community that people wanted to join it, be a part of it. And what this scripture shows us is that the early church, they gathered in the temple courts. And the temple was the center of Jewish religious life. You went to the temple to worship, to pray, to deal with your sins, to seek forgiveness. So they went to the temple, the temple courts, a place of prayer and worship, a public gathering. But they also gathered in homes. And homes were the center of domestic life. And so, in other words, the first Christians gathered in a larger public setting for prayer and teaching and worship. And they gathered in homes for food. Likely that was how they did communion, a meal. And for prayer and for teaching and for worship. A large gathering and a small gathering. A public gathering and more private gatherings in homes. Now, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, and the New Testament says that we are the temple, that the, the presence of God dwells in us. But still to this day, we do something similar, in that we gather in a larger public setting, and we gather weekly in small groups, 29 all around the city, large gatherings and small gatherings, public gatherings, and private gatherings. And I've been doing vocational ministry for over 15 years. It started when I was 13, so do the math. Um, no, I'm older than that, older than 27. Um, but I've been doing vocational ministry for over 15 years. And what's curious is that most complaints I've heard about Sunday gatherings or complaints about small groups come from wanting to turn one into the other. And here's what I mean, right? I don't like small groups. There should be teaching, less discussion. I wanna learn new things, I wanna hear from an expert. I want, you know, like a dynamic worship environment, not an out of tune guitar and out of key singing. And listen, it's too vulnerable to be in someone's house, sitting around in a circle. And these questions, they're too personal. In other words, I want a Sunday morning. I want to slip in and slip out. Or it's like, hey, I don't like Sunday mornings. There should be less teaching, less monologue, more dialogue, more discussion, more vulnerability. Let's get rid of the pews. Let's get chairs. Let's put the chairs in circles and let's chat. I want to know more than the back of a person's head. I want to know people. I want to move from rows to circles. I want Sundays to be a small group. The early church had both, and so do we. And both help us grow in different ways. And both can be very good for our growth in holiness. The early church gathered in public and in private, larger gatherings, smaller gatherings. And what did the first followers of Jesus do when they gathered? Well, we read about it. I told you about some of what they did. In Acts 2, it says they were devoted to scripture, to reading, teaching scripture. They were devoted to prayer, to hospitality, to radical generosity. They were devoted to all of these things. And that continued in the life of the church. In the second century, there's a letter from Justin Martyr, who was a Christian philosopher and apologist in the second century. And in this letter, we still have it today, he talks about what the Christians would do on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. And he said their gathering included reading from scripture, a sermon or message, communal prayer, and communion. And so in the second century, Christian gathered, they gathered and they read from scripture and they would hear a sermon and they would pray together and they would sing together and they'd celebrate communion with the meal. They were marked by a radical generosity. So what we do today in small groups and large gatherings goes right back to the very beginning. It's continued throughout history, though different in style, it's similar in substance. 
And this is true all around the world today, right? This week, hundreds of millions of Christians will gather. Thousands of different cities, hundreds of different countries, all meeting to do these things. And it looks different, right? Big, small, loud, quiet, charismatic, contemplative, long gatherings, shorter gatherings. It looks different. That's why we don't take style or preference too seriously at the way. We have our way of doing things, but we don't moralize our preferences. Because what really matters and what is happening in all different traditions and styles every Sunday is that in some way the Bible is open and read. And we sing songs together. And we take communion and we pray and we serve and we give and we hear the word taught. And though different in style, same in substance. And when we gather with believers, we're connecting ourselves to Jesus and to believers all around the world, all throughout history. And that is a beautiful thing. We gather together because the early church did. And Christians have gathered and continue to gather to this day. Second point, we gather because Scripture instructs us to gather. And so let me read you a passage of Scripture from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 23 to 25. You've probably heard this passage if you've been in church for a while. The writer says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. The day there is the second coming of Jesus to judge unrepentant sin and restore all things every day brings us a, you know, a step closer to that day. And so we're to hold on to the hope we have in Jesus. But right in the middle there, it says this, let us consider. So that requires thoughtfulness and intention. Consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And I'd circle the word habit. Because some people made a choice once. I won't gather. I don't need to gather. And the first choice made it easier to make the second choice. I didn't gather, the sky didn't fall. In fact, I enjoyed recapturing the time. And the second choice made it easier to make the third choice, and so on and so on until there was barely a choice left to make. A habit had been formed. Scripture says, hey, don't do that. Don't neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. A habit has been formed. And the reality is faith was never meant to be done in isolation or all alone. It was never just Jesus and me. It was always Jesus and we. As two commentators write on this passage, those who neglect assembling together cut themselves off from the very means by which Christ feeds, assures, and protects his people. There's even a stronger warning in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 12 to 15, where the writer says this. I think a lot about this verse, actually. He says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. That turning doesn't always happen all at once. It's one choice and then another choice that sets a trajectory of turning away from the living God. Then he says, instead of that, encourage one another daily as long as it's still called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It says, keep gathering together so you won't be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. There's this classic illustration. Uh, it's like of coals in a fireplace glowing red hot. I'm sure if you've gathered for decades in church, you've heard this illustration. But in case you haven't, the idea is you've got coals, they're, they're glowing red hot in a fireplace. If you remove one of the coals, it's not long before the coal gets cold and dark. And if you want the coal to get red hot again, you need to place it with the other coals. 
And it's like, hey, if you want to have red-hot passion for the things of God, you need to be around people with a red-hot passion for the things of God. And let me put it like this. There are moments in my life where I don't feel like singing, and I don't feel like believing, and I don't feel like hearing a sermon. I don't want to do it. Or I'm tired of doing it. And even if I want to want to want to sing and believe and hear the word taught, I just can't get there in myself. And if I neglect gathering with other believers and isolate myself, the only person I get to be around is someone who doesn't want to sing, believe, or hear the word of God preached. If I don't gather with other believers, I'm left with myself and those who think I shouldn't gather with other believers. It's going to be hard to get unstuck. But on the other hand, when I feel like dry and disconnected from God and get around people who are passionate about Jesus, it inspires me and gives me hope that things could be different and better and fresh again. Like sometimes I need to see Jesus being worshipped and loved to learn to love and worship him again. And I learned that from others. And so we gather together to encourage one another and to spur one another on to love and good deeds. And I don't know if you've, um, I don't know if you've heard the one another commands in the New Testament, but there's like 50 of them. And there's at least 16 times in the New Testament where it says, you know, love one another. But there's a bunch of these. And I'll give you some examples. Be devoted to one another. Romans 12, verse 10. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12, 10. Live in harmony with one another. Build up one another. Bear with and forgive one another. Be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving to one another. See good for one another. And don't repay evil for evil. On and on, there's like 50 of these in the New Testament. And it's hard to seek good for one another without one another. Like it's hard to build up one another without one another. It's hard to love one another without one another. You get the idea. Like I can't obey the New Testament teaching or what it envisions for life together on my own. It's never been just Jesus and me. It's always been Jesus and we. I like to say that through Christ, we get adopted into a family. And in that family, we have a perfect father, but imperfect brothers and sisters who we have to learn to do life with. To learn to love one another, serve one another, be devoted to one another. It's a communal affair, and so we gather to, to remind ourselves of that reality. We gather to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Point three. Third, we gather because it's good for us. Uh, there's plenty of evidence in peer-reviewed journal articles about the spiritual and emotional and physical health that gathering with people can bring into your life, specifically even religious services, how it can be healing and restorative in our lives. There's plenty of that data out there. We gather because it's good for us. But I was reading this book, and uh, it's, I think it's a well-known book, but it's called What Happened to You? And it was written by Oprah and uh, a trauma expert, Dr. Bruce Perry. And in the book, I was surprised by this. I was just reading it because I was interested. But in the book, Oprah makes this strong, compelling case for church, for gathering. And so I'm going to quote uh, Oprah. So, <laughs> and I don't know when this will happen again. So, <laughs> she writes this in the book. It's kind of a conversation, but in it she writes this. As I was preparing to leave my family and the life I knew, my father's advice to me was, find a church home. At the time, I thought it was because he wanted to make sure I kept Jesus in my life. Looking back now, though, as we talk about the healing power of relationships, I realize it wasn't just about finding a place of worship. It was about finding a community and discovering true, lasting connection in a new city. 
It was your church family that made sure you had a place to go for Sunday dinner. They were the ones who visited you when you were sick or passed around the collection plate if you couldn't put food on the table. The church was even where we created that healing sense of rhythm. Our music connected us and lifted us. And this is a parenthesis, but Dr. Carolyn Leaf points out that when we sing together, our hearts start to beat as one on rhythm. Not only that, when we praise God in thanksgiving, there's an, you know, an increase in certain neurotransmitters that prime the brain for change, for new thinking, and for healing, which is very cool. And a parenthesis, back to Oprah. Um, she continues, she says, I see that a key to healing from trauma is finding your church home, your people, your community. This can help build resilience, post-traumatic healing, and ultimately post-traumatic wisdom. It can help you become wise. And in response, Dr. Perry, the academic expert, replies, quote, absolutely. A healthy community is a healing community, and a healing community is full of hope because it's seen its own people weather, survive and thrive. And gathering with the people of God is meant to be good for you, a healing community full of hope. Now I know the flip side is real. An unhealthy community is a community that can hurt you, wound you, leave deep scars. And we all know people who've given up on gathering for this reason. And there's plenty of pain to go around, right? Bad leadership can wound people. Toxic people can wound leadership. Leaders fail people. People fail leaders. Church hurt abounds. And sometimes you can feel like throwing in the towel. And there might be moments in all of our journey, or maybe there have been moments, where we've really been tempted to do it. And we've had very good reasons to do it. But if you're still here, I wonder if it's like me, you've, you've also seen the church in action being what Jesus has called it to be. And you've experienced it as a place of, of hope and healing. And our desire is that we would create a community you know, submitted to the word of God, loving Jesus, loving one another, repenting of our sin, renewing our minds, admitting our failings, asking God for strength to become more and more like Jesus, to share the love we've experienced ourselves, putting the lonely in families, visiting the sick, serving one another in kindness, growing in holiness. And I know sometimes it's like, well, the church hurt me. The church can't heal me. And that makes sense when I'm in the middle of the hurt. But I don't know if that's true. Because that's like saying, people hurt me, people can't heal me. We know that is untrue. In fact, it might be impossible to heal without loving people. And so at some point, we have to begin the journey of trusting again and saying, an unhealthy church hurt me, but a healthy church can heal me. And that's what God intends. And so years and years ago, there was a young woman at my last church, and she came into the church limping from a past experience. And after being a part of our community for just over a year, she said to my wife, you invited me in, and you love me back to life. You invited me in, and you love me back to life. That is our hope for this community. The early church father, Irenaeus, said, the glory of God is a person fully alive. What we want to do here is love people back to life through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is good for us. And that type of community doesn't just get created, you know, for us. It gets created by us. By us together. And so we gather together because it's meant to be good for us. That's what God intends. Before moving on to point four, um, I'll mention one more thing, because I've been using the word good. Uh, when I was younger, we would sometimes come back from church, and the question would be asked, how was church? And what we meant was, you know, was the gathering good? And we would roast the preacher, and 
I'm giving you a lot of material for that today. You know, quoting Oprah, stuff like that. Um, we went, was the gathering good? And I'm not sure if that's a good question. In fact, it might be a bad question. Was the gathering good? A better question might be, did the gathering do good in me? And the answer can be yes, especially over time. Like sometimes you come to a gathering and God zaps you. Like God does something so transformative in a moment and you're never the same again. People come into our gatherings and sometimes encounter Jesus for the first time. The whole trajectory of their life is now different. Or you come to church and God just meets you in a place of shame and breaks the stranglehold it's had on your joy in a moment. And you're not the same again. People come into a gathering like this, they get prayed for healing. Maybe there's physical ailments in their body and God touches them and heals them and they're not the same again. Maybe it totally transforms their view of God, that God is present and he cares and he sees me and he knows me and he heals body, soul, spirit. Like in a moment, that can happen at a gathering like this. But sometimes showing up week after week might feel more like water running over a rock like slowly shaping it and smoothing over the rough edges, over time transforming its appearance. And the change is slow, but it's happening. And every Sunday coming is like dipping yourself in the water again. It's like did hearing the word of God, being prayed for, taking communion, singing together, do good in me. Yes, and even more so, over time. And so maybe a better question is, did the gathering do something good in me? But, you know, we thought about this, and maybe go to the next slide, because I thought, oh no, okay, they didn't do it that way, never mind. Um, I wanted to go from bad to better to very mature. So not was the, you know, the gathering good, not even did the gathering do good in me, but the very mature question I could ask is, was I good for others at the gathering? Was I good for others at the gathering? Was I spurring others on to love and good deeds? Because that's how I move from a consumer of content to a creator of community that's restorative for people. And if I come to bring a blessing, I will always get a blessing without fail. It's how God set up the universe to work. <laughs> Was I good for others at the gathering? Point four, last point. Fourth, we gather on Sunday because the resurrected Christ rose from the dead on Sunday. And so for centuries, God's people gathered to worship on a Saturday, the day of Sabbath, the day of rest. And yet shortly after Jesus' death on the cross, that shifted. And by the end of the first century, Sunday worship was the norm for the church, this huge shift. They would worship on the Lord's Day, a Sunday. Why? Why? Because that was the day that Christ rose from the dead. And because more important than the seventh day of creation is the first day of new creation. That Sunday is the Lord's day, the day the new world came into being. And so we meet on this day to help each other live more fully into the new creation, bursting out right in the middle of the old creation. That we get up out of our beds on a Sunday morning in response to the God who loved us in Jesus, who paid for our sins on the cross to reconcile us to our maker, and who got up out of the grave. And we get up out of our beds on a Sunday to worship the risen Son of God. And we're realigning our lives around the most important event in history. And we're saying what is most important in history is going to be most important in my life. Not only that, what is most important in eternity is going to be most important in my life, worshiping the risen Christ with the called out people of God. And so we meet on this day to help each other live more fully into the new world God is creating right in the middle of the old one. We remind each other that we belong to this new world, citizens of heaven, manning outposts on earth, pockets of light pushing back the darkness, testifying to the coming dawn. We gather on Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday. And we gather to reorientate all of our lives around him. We gather to remind ourselves of what is most important.
Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, be devoted to one another. Honor one another. Bear with and forgive one another. Be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving to one another. Seek good for one another. And don't repay evil for evil. And love one another, love one another, love one another. All in response to the fact that God loved us first in Jesus. There's this... um. There's this old story about John the Apostle, and maybe it's apocryphal, but he was the last living disciple of Jesus. He was his closest earthly friend. And John lived to an old age, and he kind of retired in Ephesus. And they would gather as a church, and they would carry Grandpa John to the front of the church because he can no longer walk. And John would be like carried to the front of the church and you know these second and third generation believers would, would hear about his close friend Jesus. John would tell stories. Oh, I remember the time when Jesus healed the man blind since birth. And we saw him see color for the first time. And it started this controversy and it was wild. We couldn't believe it. I remember this time we were at a wedding and the bridegroom, they ran out of wine. They were going to experience such shame and embarrassment. And then Jesus took these ceremonial jugs filled with water and made the best wine I'd ever tasted. You should have been there. And so John would get up in front of the church and he would tell them stories about their friend Jesus, his friend Jesus. And he would end each gathering with these words. Dear children, Jesus loves you. Love one another. Dear children, Jesus loves you. Love one another. And we gather to be reminded of that every week. And one of the ways we're reminded is through communion, where we celebrate Jesus and his body given for us and his blood shed for us. And we celebrate communion every week because the early church celebrated it. We celebrate communion every week because Jesus told us to do it. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. We celebrate communion every week because it's good for us. It's good to be reminded that our sins are forgiven. It's good to be reminded that the God of the universe loves us and is for us and showed his love to us through the person of Jesus, his death for our sins, his resurrection from the dead. And that's the fourth reason we celebrate communion, that Jesus didn't just die as another poor martyr. He died willingly for our sins, laying down his life. And then God raised him from the dead. And because of that, we have hope. And when he tells us our sins are forgiven, when he tells us we're welcomed into the presence of God, when he tells us there's new beginnings, when he tells us there's hope, we can believe him on the authority of his resurrection from the dead.